Hello, and welcome to our NYU Langone Orthopedic Webinar Pediatric Sports Medicine. Pediatric ACL Injuries, uh, State of the Art. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tyler, and I will be the facilitator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Q&A window. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Send button or press Enter. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed throughout and at the end of the presentation. We are joined today by our presenters, Guillaume Gonzalez Lomas, MD, uh, Cordelia W. Carter, MD, Late M. Jazrawi, MD, Heather Milton, MS. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our presenters to begin the presentation. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is Michael Shah. I'm one of the uh, course directors uh, for the whole webinar series here at NYU Langone. I am, I do happen to be one of the sports medicine physicians as well. Uh, today we're actually talking about what I find to be a very, very, very interesting topic is pediatric ACL reconstructions, uh, a, uh, a surgery that can be challenging certainly for, for many of us. Uh, we are joined by our panel of experts today. Um, that would be uh, first and foremost Cordelia Carter, who's the, the director of, of this webinar today. She's the head of the Women's Sports Medicine Center as well as the Pediatric Sports Medicine Center here at NYU Langone or, or, uh, Orthopedics, as well as our division chief, Laith Jezrawi, uh, who uh, does a fair number of these uh, pediatric ACL reconstructions as well as Guillaume Gonzalez-Lomas, who is uh, um, involved in fight medicine, as well as uh, takes care of our uh, National Women's Hockey League team at, uh, in uh, New Jersey. Um, I would like to start off uh, with uh, introducing Guillaume for our first talk. All right, thanks a lot, Mayhul. And uh, we're going to have to go back here to the beginning. Let's see here. All right, I let the cat out of the bag already, but uh, hopefully uh, everyone here has uh, you know short short memories. So uh, you know, I, I thought um, or I was asked to participate and to start off talking about really the original pediatric ACL injury, which is uh, tibial spine avulsions. And um, these go back a, a fair bit. And, uh, you know, management for these, you know, a, a lot of the concepts will be echoed by Cordelia, Laith, uh, Heather, and um, the speakers that come after. And, uh, but, the, you know, the, there is a little bit of a difference in that in, in these cases, you know, there's really still the, uh, the, the concept is to, to try to, you know, really preserve the anatomy and um, and uh, repair. And so, you know, we'll talk about ACL repair as well later on. But, you know, these are cases where early on the uh, the repairs were being attempted and w with some success. So if you look at uh, some of the old literature here, here's uh, a, an old case report from uh, the 50s, and they were really describing how the first um, tibial spine avulsion repair uh, was successfully performed in 1907. You know, it's kind of interesting when you look back at some of this uh, literature, and uh, one of the ways that they secured the tibial spines was, was with uh, uh, beef bone screws. And, and really, that's just because, you know, kangaroo tendon doesn't cut it. And uh, I've found that myself, um, you know, I really prefer not to use kangaroo tendon uh, when I can. Uh, but for that beef bone, that fresh beef bone, uh, you just want to make sure that you uh, boil the shaft for one and a half hours uh, just to, you know, really sterilize it nicely. Uh, anyway, it is just interesting, you know, taking a look at uh, how things were done in the past and how much we've advanced, but also the, you know, just conceptually uh, the idea of being able to fix something like this. So, you know, kind of m moving forward a century or so, uh, this is not the most common injury you'll see in children. They will typically tear their ACL more commonly. So three out of 100,000 kids per year, and really only 2 to 5% of all pediatric knee injuries. 
Um, that said, you always want to be on the lookout for these. And I'll say this again later in the talk, but one important point is sometimes, the, sometimes uh, these injuries involve an avulsion of the chondral plate and not the bone. So you won't see the bone avulsed on x-ray, but you need to make sure that you identify that there's an ACL deficiency. And then when you're in there, be prepared to potentially uh, repair it at that time. Um, the mechanism, and then Tyler, you can play the video here, is uh, really very similar to that of an ACL. Uh, you're going to have your standard pivot shift mechanism, internal rotation, little flexion, and valgus, uh, as in this case, or straight hyperextension. Uh, you can go back to the slides now. Um, so really very similar mechanism, and uh, just in these cases, you're going to have the bone avulsed instead of the uh, mid-substance tear or a tear off of the femur. And uh, you know, with these kids, the issue is that that bone is weak, uh, and also that chondral plate, uh, is, you know, can be pretty weak as well. So on x-ray, you'll see that avulsion you can see on the sagittal. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to see, less overlap. But really, the MRI is absolutely the key here, and I'd say most of us really wouldn't have a, an unstable knee treated without an MRI, uh, barring some very unusual medical contraindication. Uh, but yeah, th this is really where the money's at. And the reason is that these injuries oftentimes will involve some sort of soft tissue entrapment. And we'll get into that shortly. But you really have to ensure that nothing is preventing that spine from being reduced. And uh, the reality is that if it's a, a displaced fracture of any kind, the rate or the risk of soft tissue entrapment starts going up uh, pretty significantly. So the traditional classification dates back to the 50s. Myers and McKeever, really, they, they, their name has remained eponymous with tibial spine avulsions. And the idea here is that your type 1s are going to be non-displaced, type 2s about one-third to 50% hinging uh, with the anterior aspect off, type 3s completely displaced, and type 4s comminuted. Uh, but these, they are, this classification was really designed purely for x-rays. This preceded the incorporation of MRIs into everyday practice and didn't account for that soft tissue entrapment and has been shown to have somewhat limited intra and intra-observer re uh, reliability. So um, Danny Green in, uh, uh, here in New York uh, proposed a different classification that uses uh, MRI, and they uh, do sagittal based cuts mostly to identify this. And really the concept here is just to make sure that you uh, uh, correlate those uh, avulsions which have a higher risk of having soft tissue entrapment correctly. And so again, non-displaced is your grade one. That's going to be non-displaced every day. Uh, grade twos, you have a little bit of anterior hinging, potentially some posterior hinging, less than two millimeters displacement. And then really the type threes are the ones you're worried about where you can have that intrameniscal ligament or meniscus or even piece of chondral um, for a, a fragment of uh, the cartilage of the plateau involved and interposed. So you can really summarize these by either a displaced fracture, a meniscal or intrameniscal ligament entrapment. This would be based on the MRI, of course, or the articular surface being uh, affected. Now, what about associated injuries? We just talked about them, and that meniscus entrapment is a big deal. The, this is a, an image of an intermeniscal ligament. Uh, but uh, either one, meniscus or intermeniscal ligament, will affect reduction of that avulsion. So you're in your non-displaced for obvious reasons, you wouldn't have any. As you go up in displacement, you're going to have a greater risk, up to about 50% of your type 3s. So really have to look out for these. And obviously, once you've got that um, displaced piece with an interposed soft tissue fragment, you're really looking at operative intervention. And there you can see that inter intermeniscal ligament. There's an interesting study out of Germany which looked at concomitant injuries, so not necessarily the ones that were interposed, but what other injuries occurred. And not surprisingly, this did not depart too much from the typical ACL-associated injuries, so your lateral meniscus more commonly uh, with acute injuries. Um, the total number of these avulsions that had an associated meniscus injury was about 37%, and the vast majority involved the lateral meniscus. And one thing that's a little different here is that a lot of them involved either the posterior horn or that anterior root, and it makes sense since the anterior root is also really attaching to that, that spine, and so when it uh, evulses, it's going to take the root with it. Uh, 
and potentially injure it some more. Um, and uh, you know, uh, with complex tearing ex extending from the root. Finally, cartilage injuries. This is a nice study from Kevin Shea, and they found a pretty substantial concomitant uh, chondral injury rate with tibial spine avulsion. So they found 57 out of 83. That's the majority. Uh, so obviously, this is just a situation where you're going to want to be prepared for any of these when you um, address them uh, arthroscopically. As far as treatment is concerned, type 1s can still be immobilized. There's a little bit of debate, and we can get into this later, about whether to do it in extension or in a little bit of flexion, but I'd say most people uh, would recommend extension just because that uh, allows some bony um, apposition and uh, does allow the ACL to, uh, to be relaxed, uh, so it's not pulling on that fragment. Uh, but certainly still uh, some people would recommend a, a little bit of flexion. For the type 2s, uh, my recommendation, uh, recommendation would be to treat these with surgery. It's just, uh, you know, there's, there is a, a, you know, decent risk of there being interposed tissue, and you can follow them every week and make sure that they don't displace, but I think with the techniques we have available to us now, it's pretty reasonable to try to get these anatomic. And then the type 3s um, are going to be, Type threes and fours are going to be surgically fixed. Again, this is using the McKeever classification. We know that if you don't treat them operatively, there's a significant amount of persistent laxity, really unacceptable laxity. So this would be, you know, clinically relevant laxity. Operatively, that uh, rate goes down to only about 14%. And just a, a, another word to the wise, make sure you don't forget about these cartilaginous avulsions. Obviously, you're always looking clinically at these patients. If they have a, a positive Lachman, uh, they're probably going to be operative candidates. But, uh, you know, make sure you look at the MRI closely that, and you don't miss uh, those cartilaginous avulsions. Um, so fixation, I mean, this is, I think, where you know, some of the uh, decision tree options arise and probably dealer's choice. Staple and screw, metal, you know, always very effective. Just make sure you avoid the physis. And, you know, the thing with these is that for a lot of these kids, you know, they're small knees. And uh, the screws that you need to use are fairly large. So you can end up with impingement issues. You can uh, break up that fragment. It's not always the most robust bone. End up with some comminution. And for many of these, they will require a second surgery for hardware removal. So it's worth noting that. Uh, here's a case of mine. This is an old tibial spine avulsion. So this patient's an adult now in her 20s. And that this was done with a staple. And, you know, just to give you kind of an idea of helping uh, the, the guy after you, um, you know, this is the MRI we had to get. Uh, she had uh, some chondral issues and that staple just, you know, completely obliterated everything. That was a, a useless MRI. So we ended up uh, having to do a scope, um, you know, just for, for diagnostic purposes and took out that staple. These can be pretty hard to take out too if they've been there for a while. But, um, you know, just, just another, you know, potential drawback to using metal. I'd say a lot of us are using suture now. It's uh, a little bit more benign on the growth plates. Here's uh, an example. Uh, this is a patient. Uh, this is a mature patient. It's got a really mature patient, but the concept still applies. So this is a comminuted fracture. You can see there on the MRI, it's a vulst. Uh, I think pretty clearly would be a type 3, and it looks like there there might be something interposed in there or wanting to be interposed. And then, Tyler, you can play the video here. So just take you through a quick tour of what we did. Um, so, uh, you know, identifying the uh, fracture, you can see we lift up the bony bed, and uh, we can reduce this uh, anatomically. Fortunately, it's a, you've got here acutely. Uh, I like to put a K-wire just to reduce it and, uh, anatomically, keep it there while we're doing everything else. That way we know our length tension relationship is ideal, as ideal as we can get it. And then we're gonna pass our, uh, in this case we use a, a kind of lasso type device and uh, pass a couple of sutures, try to uh, really, you know, cinch that, uh, the ACL stump. Uh, most people now will figure eight this to really grab that and you're using the bone almost as a washer and then you pass two tunnels on either side and you really you don't want to go bigger than the ACL drill so you know 3.2 millimeter tunnels is about all you need and uh, you know then you can reduce that nicely and then secure it over a bone bridge anteriorly or uh, over a button um, or you can even use a 
uh, a not list device to do that. And here, that's exactly what we did in this case, and so this is a few months later and everything looks nicely healed. Uh, what about outcomes? There's a few systematic reviews, not a ton out there, but really what they concluded is, again, dealer's choice, you could do screw or sutures, screw a little more stiffness, obviously a, a greater removal of hardware rate, and probably a little bit more lax if you look closely at the data, but really no clinical difference overall. And I, this is kind of an interesting concept. I think all of these, as we'll see in a second, um, all of these cases do have some residual laxity, but preserving that native ACL seems to preserve that neuro, uh, neuromuscular um, uh, you know, ability that uh, the knee has, uh, you know, proprioception, et cetera. And that seems to make a really big difference in allowing these patients to uh, at least perceive the knee as stable. Biomechanics, screw versus suture. Um, here's a screw. Everything else is a version of suture. Load to failure, screw did not do well, but cyclic loading, it was uh, pretty similar. And as you can imagine, you're probably going to get failure here through cyclic loading more than, you know, someone falling again. So I'd say that, uh, you know, it's the, the jury's still out on that. What about uh, fysial sparing over open physes? If you're going to use uh, uh, sutures, Vicro is preferred over uh, fiber wire by some studies, only because fiber wire can cause some osteolysis. Personally, I still use a non-absorbable material. I'm just a little concerned about uh, the Vicro failing too soon. But uh, the data, you know, theoretically, you, you could recommend very thick Vicro. And then uh, transficeal sutures, really mostly okay. The vast majority of studies that have looked at this have shown absolutely no growth disturbance. I only found one study with two cases of growth disturbance. So I think you're pretty safe doing that, especially as you get into some older patients. But really try to minimize that tunnel size for obvious reasons. Uh, finally, complications. The main take-home point is all of these cases will be lax. It's, it's going to happen about 80% or more in, in many of these studies will have a uh, greater Lachman on one side than the other, although they will have a, an endpoint. Uh, in uh, the study, the best study to date to look at the percentage of cases that went on to require an ACL reconstruction found that about 19% in total, and the odds seem to increase for every year patients got older, um, which makes sense, a little bit less remodeling. Uh, just with age. Stiffness is another big one. A lot of these get stiff, and here you're kind of fighting a bit of a battle. So if you immobilize, it's possible that you decrease the risk of of the of the fixation failing, but if you mobilize too long, your risk of arthrofibrosis goes up tremendously, and more than four weeks is uh, really the risk goes up astronomically. So there's probably a sweet spot here, mobilizing for a couple weeks and then starting to move. Non-union rates uh, are another possible complication, but these are very low. Uh, rehab, it, really similar to ACLs, uh, there's two schools of thought, either immobilize or you start on CF, CPM immediately. And again, I would just caution you to not immobilize too long if you are going to do that. And then same as weight-bearing is tolerated, non-weight-bearing. There's a bunch of uh, different ideas here. I think either one works. Uh, whatever works in your hands is probably the right thing to do. So to summarize, really identify these early, and uh, at this point, 2019, there's no reason to not get an MRI. Surgical fixation for any displacement is the way to go, and screws or sutures, I personally uh, prefer sutures. I think uh, you're uh, completely justified in, in using screws if, uh, if you'd like, based on the biomechanical and clinical data we've got, uh, but just be wary of possible complications. And uh, again, just know that the older those kids get, the, the greater the risk of residual laxity. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cordelia. Hey, uh, Guillaume, this is uh, Mayhol. Great talk. Um, there is a question from the audience. Um, Guillaume, before seeing the MRI, are there any specific cues besides age that would make you be more concerned that there's an avulsion rather than a, another type of ACL tear? Meaning a cartilaginous avulsion, uh, I, I assume the question is getting at. Uh, so n no real clues. These cases will present you know very similarly i mean you've lost that you know if you think of the acl as a rope attached at two ends you've lost the attachment at one end so 
the you know to to the examiner that Lockman will feel exactly the same as if you have a mid substance or a femoral avulsion off the AC, you know uh, of the ACL. Uh, so really, not a lot of clues, but uh, if other than the fact that they're unstable. So if you know they've got a positive Lockman, positive anterior drawer, make sure you get an MRI to you know identify the problem. I would also add to that. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. This is uh, Cordelia Carter. Hi there. Um, actually, the biggest clue is just that there's an effusion, right? We know that an effusion, you know, a traumatic effusion in a kid is never normal, and it is, you know, it's an ACL tear, it's a meniscus tear, it's an osteochondral fracture, or it's a tibial spine avulsion, you know, until proven otherwise. So, so the, you know, the, you get the, you elicit the history, you examine them, and and you note instability, and then the effusion is the thing that's going to prompt you really to be concerned and do additional workup. I think. Yeah, I All right. agree wholeheartedly. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, and for our listeners, again, if you have any questions, please type them in, and we'll be trying to answer them as we go. Great talk, GM. Um, and before we move on, I apologize. I left out uh, introducing our esteemed registered clinical exercise physiologist, Heather Milton, who will be giving a talk later on ACL prevention. So moving on to our next topic, we're moving on talking about mid-substance tears of the ACL in children. And Dr. Carter will be talking about the epidemiology, risk factors, and prevention. Uh, awesome. All right. Let's get started. I have no disclosures with this talk. So we're, we're going to do a quick background, epidemiology, risk factors, prevention, how to evaluate, and then initial management. Uh, so this is a big review, but as you know, the anterior cruciate ligament, its anatomy is that it runs from the posterior lateral femoral condyle to the anterior medial tibial plateau and forms the cross of the PCL, and this is how we get, it gets its name. And it limits anterior translation of the tibia as well as rotation of the tibia. Historically, the mid-substance ACL injury was believed to be really rare in kids, and so the, the tibial spine fracture, which we just reviewed, was considered to be the pediatric equivalent of an ACL tear. And in this setting, just like we heard about, failure, uh, failure occurs through the epiphyseal bone at the ligamentous insertion rather than through the mid-substance of the ligament itself. But we also know that uh, in the last decade or two, we've seen increasing rates of both a mid-substance ACL injury as well as reconstruction for ACL injuries uh, in, the, in the pediatric population. Reasons for this may be simply that we're more aware that this injury happens, and so we're better at making the diagnosis because it's on our radar. There also may be a true increase in the number of these injuries that occur. We've seen a changing pattern in sport participation amongst our kids. Uh, they, they participate in sports if at younger ages, with, um, and there are higher physical demands placed upon them. And then the whole, um, the whole way that we practice sports, so sports specialization, uh, has contributed to overuse uh, and acute injuries uh, that we are seeing at greater and greater numbers. In terms of the increased incidence of ACL injuries, there have been a couple of studies that have looked specifically at this. One that was published in 2015 looked at the five-year uh, period between 2007 and 2011. They looked at 10 to 14-year-olds and found that the nationwide rate of ACL injury increased nearly 20%, or at least the diagnosis of such, and the reconstruction rate increased by almost 28%. Emily Dodwell uh, here in New York uh, published on the, on the uh, instance of this injury in New York State. So uh, these authors looked at actually a 20-year period from 1990 to 2009. They looked at age 3 to 20, so true, like, you know, running a gamut of the pediatric years. And they found that in New York State, there was a significantly increased rate of ACL reconstruction over that time from 18 per 100,000 in 1990 to 51 per that same amount in 2009. So we're seeing this injury more, we're diagnosing it more frequently, and we're treating it operatively at an increasing rate. Uh, this is my this is my uh, pet thing, so I'll bring it up every time I can. But uh, you know, something to know about ACL tears in kids, especially, is that females have a higher rate of ACL tear than males. This has previously been estimated to be as high as eight times the risk. Although I typically, based on a couple of more recent studies, will quote this to my patients as, as being about twofold the risk for a female athlete. Uh, that said, you know, when we talk about the, epi the um, epidemic of ACL injuries in our adolescent females, we sort of picture that 15-year-old soccer player. The absolute number of ACL injuries in, is actually higher in males who have a higher exposure rate. And so really this affects all of our kids and not just females or males. 
In terms of risk factor for ACL tear, um, there are different ways to look at this. There are intrinsic and extrinsic risk factors. Some of the intrinsic risk factors that are commonly cited include, include those that are anatomic. That's the increased Q angle, an increased posterior tibial slope, decreased intercondylar notch width, a decreased volume of the ACL itself, and then uh, ligamentous laxity at baseline. There have been a couple of uh, studies that have identified additionally genetic factors that may contribute to ACL injury. This study was uh, published in JBJS in 2015, uh, and these authors actually took tissue samples from torn ACLs in patients that were undergoing surgery. They had seven male patients and seven female patients who were undergoing ACL reconstruction. They sent that tissue to the lab, and they looked specifically at a, a host of different genes. And what they found uh, was actually that there were three genes associated with matrix regulation and collagen production that actually they had significantly differential expression between males and females, and I've listed them here. And so the question is actually, do we, is some of the risk factor that we see that's intrinsic, is it genetic and is it sex-based? So are female, are female ACLs actually weaker uh, than those of their male counterparts? A second study highlighted this as well. Uh, this was a study, it's kind of a cool one, that was done in, in um, pigs, so in an animal uh, in the lab. Uh, this was done out of Boston and published in 2015. So these pigs actually underwent uh, surgical transection of their native ACLs. They then had a sex-matched allograft uh, BTB ACL donor, so an ACL reconstruction using an AC, or a BTB allograft, but it was sex-matched. And what these authors found was that the structural properties of those grafts when the animals were sacrificed and evaluated the laxity of those knees and the damage to the cartilage were all significantly worse than the female animals. And so this led the authors to conclude that perhaps this one size fits all approach, meaning every person who presents with an ACL injury gets the same uh, surgery and the same treatment, does this actually make sense? And I think this is um, you know, foreshadowing of uh, the later talk on a, a hot topic uh, in ACL injury and treatment in pediatric uh, in, the, in our pediatric population. Uh, more recently, there have also been uh, some studies that have pointed to hormonal risk factors. So, for example, we know that estrogen receptors are present on the fibroblasts and ACLs. We know that relaxin, which is a hormone produced in females but not in males, can bind to the ACL. And we seem to, and we, it has been demonstrated that higher relaxin levels correlate with ACL injury. Um, and so, for example, relaxin-2 is decreased in type 1 and 3 collagen expression in the ACL, at least in the lab. Uh, it has also been postulated, uh, and there's some evidence for uh, the idea that female athletes may be more predisposed to sustaining an ACL injury during the pre-ovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle or the first half. This is still something that's actively, you know, it has not been definitively shown. It's inconclusive, but, you know, but it's interesting to think about, and if, and if this was an area where we could uh, improve prevention or treatment, that would be awesome. And finally, I wanted to, um, with this slide especially, I wanted to make sure to thank Corinna Franklin, uh, who's worked with some of this on me, and this is a slide that I borrowed from her. Okay. It looks like somebody may have stopped sharing your presentation. Give me one second. I'm going to bring it back up for you. Thank you. No problem. Sorry, guys. You know, um, can you pull up my presentation, that first one? Oh, my apologies. Yeah, give me one second here. Thanks. You, you know, while you're doing that, so let's see. Uh, we can answer one of the questions from the last talk if you want. Oh, no, it's coming. Perfect. Thank you. So, sorry, there, there's four talks assigned to me here. Can you go to the epidemiology one? And I will, while you're pulling up epidemiology, I'll answer this question. So, in terms of, so going back to tibial spine, did you say surgical, so here's the question, did you say surgical fixation is preferred for non-displaced ACL avulsions? Uh, so I would, I would answer that no, actually. So for a non-displaced ACL avulsion fracture, the preferred treatment for that would be cast immobilization and either extension or maybe 30 degrees of flexion and then protected weight bearing. Uh, and uh, even a type 2, which starts out displaced but can be reduced uh, and then casted, can sometimes uh, be treated with a simple cast immobilization. Uh, to me, at least, the surgical indication for a tibial spine fracture is an irreducible type 2, and that's probably because you've got interposed soft tissue, whether that's the anterior horn medial meniscus or the intermeniscal ligament. Uh, 
uh, or one that has you know wide initial displacement or is comminuted or rotated. Uh, so to me, again, a non-displaced ACL avulsion injury should be treated um, with cast immobilization. Sorry, I really do have four talks. This is the third one. Can you can you pull up epidemiology? Yep, just working on finding that. Sorry about that, doctor. Thank you. Cordelia, you said you you would cast immobilize your non-displaced ones. Yep. So to me, to me, the treatment for that is a long leg cast and protected weight bearing because they actually will pretty reliably heal. Um, and if they're non-displaced, they're going to heal anatomically. You know, as Dr. Lomas mentioned, you know, plastic deformation uh, has been well described in these injuries. What that means is the ACL is actually going to stretch and deform before you get failure through with the bone itself. And so, and so actually, maybe five or ten years ago, we were still we were actually talking about over. Um, you know, over reducing these. So we would actually resect an extra amount of bone from the tibial bed so that we could really, um, so we could not just reduce, but over reduce the bony fragments and maybe restore some of the native tension to the ACL. I think that's fallen out of favor a little bit because what we know is that if we, you know, if we look at instrumented laxity in those injuries, so knee to knee, that there, that plastic deformation is going to result in some laxity in the lab, but it doesn't result in functional laxity. So, you know, kids don't report that. Um, they don't feel it, and they're reliably able to get back to sport. Perfect. We're back to our talk. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. All right. So let's go on. To, let's finish up with uh, hormonal here. So, and there, so there have been a couple of uh, big meta-analyses that have come out recently that have looked at the role of oral contraceptive pills in potentially preventing ACL injury. Um, and, and so, and there, and there's not great data, and there's certainly not level one data, uh, but there are, it, it there is uh, some data to suggest that actually taking an oral contraceptive pill may be protective against sustaining an ACL injury for adolescent females. And then the, the thing that always gets me with this is how in the world could we practically, you know, implement this? So does every, you know, does every girl take, take an oral contraceptive pill? I don't, I don't know that we are there at uh, recommending that yet, but it's certainly a, an area of really active um, study. This is where we have done, where we know the most, and these are the modifiable risk factors, so the biomechanical and the neuromuscular ones. So we know the people who are at risk for ACL injury, um, so it's the kids who have decreased hip and knee flexion angles. So if you're picturing somebody landing from a rebound, for example, they're a little more upright at the hips, they're a little more upright at the knees. There's this dynamic uh, internal hip rotation component and a dynamic knee valgus or knock knee, that's what's demonstrated in this picture. And they have a high quadriceps force. So if we look at the quadriceps to hamstring uh, strength ratio, they're very quad dominant. I think this is interesting to highlight as we start talking about graft choice. And then finally, they have a, a stiff landing. This, uh, may, you may not be able to see this uh, because it, it's a little bit uh, fine print, but this is so showing you the position of safety and the position of no return. Um, and that it's pretty much as I just described. So the landing upright, decreased hip and knee flexion, dynamic valgus internal rotation, and a stiff knee gait. Those are the things that really put a person at risk for ACL injury. The good news with, uh, our, with having identified that is that we can then um, create prevention programs that are targeted to those modifiable risk factors, and so that targets the neuromuscular and proprioceptive training. And this is not new. This is something that's been done for uh, decades, actually. It was first done in Italy, so this study that I've listed here was reported in 1996. This author looked at 600 Italian soccer players over three years. Half of the athletes went, underwent the proprioceptive retraining program, and the other half didn't, and that was the control group. Group. And what they found was a seven-fold higher rate of ACL tear in those that were untrained. Uh, and that's pretty powerful. Tim Hewitt in 1999 looked at just a neuromuscular training program and, and high school athletes, trained females, untrained females, and uh, males that were doing soccer, basketball, and volleyball. What they found was those that were trained uh, had a significantly uh, um, lower rate of serious knee injuries. And this is especially prevalent in the females. And then this is perhaps the best known. So Bert Mandelbaum in 2005 uh, reported on the Prevent Injury and Enhanced Performance Program or the PEP program. This is a comprehensive neuromuscular training program that includes warm-ups, strengthening, stretching, plyometrics, and then some soccer-specific agility drills. And I've, I've listed those here. 
Um, and when he and his co-authors yeah, looked at the efficacy of this, they looked at adolescent female soccer players aged 14 to 18. They trained almost 2,000 kids, and then they had almost 4,000 control players that they followed for two years. And similar to the one I just cited, they had six injuries in the trained group versus 67 in the untrained group. So this is a greater than 70% decrease in the ACL injury rate in the trained players, so an 88% decrease in year one and 74, uh, 74 in year two. And we know these programs are effective, so uh, this, uh, this was a meta-analysis done in 2014 that demonstrated that for non-contact ACL injuries in females, that both the, the PEPS program, the KIPP, the Knee Injury Prevention Program, and the Sports Metrics Training Program were all effective in reducing those injuries. And so the number needed to treat was between 70 and 98 athletes to prevent one ACL injury. And that's important because then a, a, another study that was done out of Columbia actually looked at the cost effectiveness of training programs. And what they found was that you could approach it two ways. You could screen all players, and then the ones who seemed to be at high risk could then be referred for a neuromuscular intervention training program. However, what they found was that rather than screening and referring, just implementing a universal neuromuscular program was perhaps the most cost effective. Um, and so, and that's something that I would advocate for. So what happens when prevention doesn't work? This is the kid who comes into your office. They say, my foot was planted and it twisted. I felt pain in the knee. I heard a pop. My knee swelled up like a grapefruit. On your exam, they've got an effusion. Even if it's early, you probably already see some atrophy of the quadriceps. You're going to do your clinical tests for an ACL tear, and you're always going to examine the other side, especially in a kid who is more, uh, more likely to be ligamentously lax diffusely than an older uh, child, an older adolescent or an adult. You're going to do your, um, your specific exams, your drawer, your lockman, and your pivot. You're going to look for associated injuries of the meniscus um, and of the collaterals. Um, and then if you're thinking about doing a surgery or surgical reconstruction for a, uh, a child, you're going to probably um, also look at their limb alignment and their limb length, and you're going to consider tanner staging as well because that's going to drive your surgical decision-making. Uh, initially, you're going to do diagnostic imaging for views of the knee. You're going to look for that tibial spine fracture, uh, bony avulsions of the collaterals or the PCL. You can look for osteochondral fractures. You can look at the growth plate. And then, again, you might do limb alignment films, uh, both to assess their baseline in case they've got a malalignment that would benefit from um, an osteotomy or, you know, or a surgical procedure prior to your reconstruction of the ACL but also to get a baseline of where they live so that you can follow for a possible iatrogenic, you know, physial arrest going forward. You're going to probably get an MRI. This is very sensitive for ACL tear as well as specific. It's also going to allow you to look for other injuries of the meniscus and cartilage as well as to assess the physial patency. And then the kids are probably going to do a skeletal maturity assessment as well with a bone age study. That's a PA radiograph of the left hand, which is, which is then compared to the Grulich and Pyle Atlas, and this helps you predict the growth remaining. Again, you're going to do the tanner staging, and in a female, you can assess monarchal status, knowing that females in general will stop growing about two years after the first period. Initial management goals are to reduce pain and swelling, to restore normal motion, to regain muscular strength, and then importantly, it's to prevent additional instability episodes, and, and these are some of the techniques that you can use to achieve those goals. Historically, non-surgical management was the mainstay, so we did bracing therapy and activity restrictions said, hey, just wait for your surgery until you're skeletally mature. The rationale for this was we wanted to protect the physis at all costs, but we know that the natural history of pediatric ACL deficient knees treated with a delayed reconstruction in that fashion is actually really poor. Uh, and so even as early as 2002, we saw that those kids had early onset arthritis and, and described poor knee function. More recently, a meta-analysis shows that there is an association between having surgery to reconstruct the ACL and fewer instability episodes, fewer rates of secondary injury, better functional outcome scores, and higher return to sport rates. That said, there does remain a role for non-surgical management. That's probably the patient with no functional instability, a low-demand patient, or perhaps a partial ACL tear. And there's a single study, at least in kids, that looks at this. This is about partial ACL tears coming out of Boston Children's in 2002, looking at 45 skills of immature kids, only a third of whom went on to require a surgical reconstruction. And what they found was that risk factors for needing that surgery were greater than 50% of uh, fibers were torn uh, if the posterior lateral bundle was involved at older age, greater than 14, and if they had objective measures of instability on exam, like a pivot shift. So it's their current management standard is for timely surgical reconstruction uh, with the goals that I've listed here. Uh, and then in summary, so we see that the rate of ACL injuries in kids is increasing. We know that females have a higher risk 
There are all of these factors that play into a risk of ACL injury. We know that ACL prevention programs are effective. We know that the natural history of kids who have ACL tears and are treated with a delayed reconstruction is actually poor. And so children likely benefit from a surgical ACL reconstruction. And with that, I will turn you over to Dr. Jezrawi to explain uh, thinking about techniques. Cordelia, great talk. We have another question from the audience. Um, this really pertains to basically on the field management, maybe as an EMS provider. What, how do you, how do you handle ACL tears preoperatively before they get to the, sorry, pre-hospital before they get to the emergency room? You know, that's a great question because the truth is, you know, the story is usually, you know, I had an injury, my knee swelled up, I went to the emergency room, they did an x-ray, the x-ray was negative, I was, I got crutches and was told to follow up. I guess I would say one, um, you know, anything that we can do to mitigate swelling or to, you know, to speed, speed the time in which we can decrease the knee effusion is probably good, uh, whether that's with aggressive icing or compression wrapping and then uh, bracing or, or crutches. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, sometimes, and, and this is not something that this is a, you know, pie in the sky. This is not a practical thing potentially, but we also know that the longer a kid goes from the time of injury to the time of surgical reconstruction, the more likely they are to have recurrent instability episodes with concomitant tearing of the meniscus or, or injuries to the cartilage. And so, and putting them therefore at risk for irreparable injuries that um, go on to early arthritis. And so, if, I guess I would I would say anything that you can do to, to ensure that a family actually will follow up in a timely fashion and that a kid understands that just because the knee feels better once that effusion goes down, it doesn't mean um, that it's normal. And so I think ensuring um, ac- you know follow up and access to follow up would probably be the best thing. Thanks so much. Again, for our audience, we encourage any questions that you have, please write it down in the text box, and we will try to answer them accordingly. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Leith Jezrawi. We'll be talking about surgical management and decision-making timing and techniques. Terrific. Thanks, uh, Mehul. Uh, again, I, I think uh, you've done a wonderful job putting this uh, webinar series together. I don't think everyone knows that you, you, you not only do you head the sports webinar, but you do all the other divisions webinar uh, as well. And I think it's a great job. And thank you, Cordelia, for inviting me for this webinar and, and leading this specific one. These are my disclosures, nothing particularly relevant to this talk. And I think it's clear that there, the benefits of youth exercise have been pushed. Whether you look at the, the seven-year-old uh, social media sensation and how good he is, it, it, one thing is certainly clear that there are many benefits of youth exercise, medical, decreased obesity rates, diabetes, uh, decreased cardiovascular risk, uh, better bone health, there's psychosocial issues, better self-esteem with exercise, decreased teen pregnancy, and decreased recreational drug use, and ultimately career, sex, uh, career success in those that are involved in sports. But, you know, when you don't work out, this is what you get. And uh, this is always the concern. And uh, whenever we push exercise, these are the, and, and, and proper diet, you know, these are the images that usually come up that you want to avoid. But there is a, there is a downside to, to playing a lot of sports and doing a lot of exercise, and it's these sports injuries. We see a lot of them in high school, two million per year. And uh, the participation in organized athletics, particularly among females, has had a thousand percent increase since 1972. There's an increased incidence of ACL injuries. Dr. Cordelia got, uh, went through this. Almost one per 2,000 patients per year. American football players, uh, almost 42 per 1,000 per patient per year. And uh, in young patients, it's even increasing more. And, and why is that? Well, there's a lot of things that come into play, year-round sports, earlier sports specialization, and multiple teams in, different, uh, multiple teams in sports in the same season. So how many ACLs are we doing? Dr. Carter got in this, in this study out of the New York uh, uh, State uh, Sparks database, ACL reconstructions in 1990, only about 17 per 100,000. This shot up to 50.9 in 2009. The rate is 50% higher in males than females in this cohort, and, and this is a major issue. And it's six t- times more common among the privately insured. So what's the controversy for the pediatric patient? Well, 
the fundamental difference is the management in, in this patient relates to the growth of the extremity. And this is what concerns everyone and why some people uh, didn't uh, – don't uh, you know uh, get involved in these type of surgeries because of their fear of the growth plates, and we really want to avoid surgical complications in this patient group. But we also want to prevent further knee injury from instability episodes and meniscus damage. And this is sort of why surgery has has come to the forefront, as non-operative treatment typically results in poor outcomes. Uh, and in the skeletally immature patient, the balance is really between these growth-related complications. And then the knee stability function, which it's that fine balance. But really, when, when these patients have instability, they damage their meniscus and have, you know, worse long-term outcomes compared to those that have their PCL reconstructed. We got into non-operative treatment, not good. Even delaying reconstructions, a four-fold increase in meniscus tear, medial meniscus tears, and an 11-fold increase in lateral compartment articular cartilage injuries. So is there ever a role uh, for non-operative treatment? Well, really, the answer is no, I think. And, you know, wh wh whether it's an elite athlete or, or someone coming up in the ranks, you know, it, it, it's certainly something where there are multiple studies out there which have looked at this. When you look at uh, the number of meniscus tears, whether it's graphs showing seven out of eight failures, those associated with meniscus tears being the, the main risk for failure, a 16 out of 23 failed non-operatively in the Jarnoff study, and, and the list goes on and on. And Dr. Cordelia Carter got into this, but really the concept is they, they, they stop playing sports, these kids, and they get high, you know, and if they do go back, they have a higher meniscus rate uh, injury. So when you look at growth, and ultimately this is what we're all concerned about, and the majority of growth is done by uh, age 14 in girls and 16 in boys. The lower extremity physis is responsible for about 21 millimeters of longitudinal growth. The proximal femur is 2 millimeters per year. The distal femur, which is the main thing we're worried about, is about six millim uh, 9 millimeters per year. Proximal tibia, 6 millimeters per year. And the distal tibia, 4 millimeters per year. And then age determination, we got into this. There's chronological age and skeletal age, and then physiological age. And, and ultimately, it's, it's figuring the balance, particularly we look at bone age to determine what surgical procedure we're doing. And, and what's the problem? Well, the, this, this study came out by Coper, Coker from the Herodica Society looking at complications. And if you look critically at this, almost the, all of them are related to patella tendon grafts, large tunnels, uh, hardware across the physis and you know any type of extra articular tenodesis so really messing around with the growth plate laterally um, and and that's the main issue and what came out of this their recommendations avoid hardware across the lateral distal physis so this is key and you'll see this in a lot of the surgical techniques this is really the main one to avoid uh, avoid hardware across the tibial tubercle apophysis. So really in a skeletally immature patient, you're not doing bone patella tendon bone autograft as you're violating the physis or putting to any type of hardware across that. Avoiding bone plugs across the physis. We, they prefer hamstrings in this population as the graft fixation is away from the physis. Avoiding large tunnels in this group and avoiding any extra articular tenodesis. And then the, the bottom line was, in this population, you want to consider physial spare and reconstruction. And that's what we're going to get into in this talk and who to consider it in. When you look at, you know, uh, uh, some of the uh, classic uh, work that was done, you know, a lot of it is, is based on avoiding the physis. And this is one of the, uh, you know, the initial uh, description of, of this, doing a physial spare and approach, where you can see, in this case, uh, a, a button is used on the femoral side again in the epiphyseal area and then on the, uh, the tibia the fixation is distal to the physis even though the drill tunnel is drilled to the epiphysis. And what it really comes down to is you know, wh what procedure are you going to do depending on the amount of bone growth left. So we use the bone age. So when they typically have a w about one year of growth remaining, so again, when you're, you're looking at uh, a girl who's typically about uh, 13 and a boy who's about 15, this is where you can start considering, you know, uh, doing uh, your adult type of procedure. So anything less than a year, I'm, I'm doing this uh, uh, again as an adult. So bone patella tendon bone or hamstrings, your choice, and really ignoring the physis. Uh, 
Now, when they start to get two to three years of growth remaining, that's when I, I consider this hybrid fixation, where I'm going to spare the femur, where there's a lot of growth remaining, and then drill through the tibia. Uh, so again, with some of the more modern techniques we have in drill guides, this can be easily done, whereas in the past I think it was a little more challenging. There are different type of devices that allow you to drill retrograde uh, in these cases and, uh, and make it much easier to perform this femoral socket. And then when you have about three to six years of growth remaining, that's when you want to do both spare the femoral epiphysis, uh, sorry, spare the femoral physis and the tibial physis. And this is typically where you have three to six years of growth remaining. Again, this is something, depending on the age, uh, size, size of the patient, you may not be able to drill um, these tunnels in the epiphysis. As the smaller the patient are, is, despite the amount of years of growth remaining, you may need to consider in the far right this IT band procedure or the modified coker where you're really doing um, a non-anatomic procedure, you're taking the IT band routed intraarticularly uh, because you don't have any tunnels that you can drill through the physis because of their size. When you look at the technique, this is a, a hamstring technique, and in the Q&A we can discuss the use of quad tending. So this is a case, 10-year-old, where we're going to spare both the femoral and tibial physis. This is a case where we sized it at 9 millimeters. We used both the gracilis and semi-T. Image intensification, drilling with a flip cutter type device or any type of device that enables you to dr drill like this from the lateral cortex. Again, confirming under image that you are below the physis. This is the epiphyseal drill tunnel. Again, try to drill in a posterior medial direction, really to get a long tunnel in that epiphysis. And then passing it uh, and then flipping the button on the lateral cortex. And then, again, as seen here, the graph with the, both, both the, the tibial and the femoral physis spare. When you look at, again, this is being revisited, and I mentioned this specifically in the pediatric population as there's been a big push to do uh, primary repair in ACL. Uh, here's a case, not, not quite a, a pediatric case, but something as, uh, to illustrate the point. 31-year-old male injured his knee while playing basketball, felt a rip in his knee, had a Lachman, positive Lachman, again, torn ACL, femoral detachment, and in this case, we opted to do um, uh, let me see if I can get that video running. We opted to do uh, a repair. So why is this attractive in the pediatric population? Well, you don't have to drill uh, across the physis. So in those femoral detachments, there's been a big push to reconsider this uh, in those cases. Now, this is not for mid-substance tear. These are generally in the more acute phase. Again, anchors can be placed after sutures are brought through the graft, and then this is secured into the anatomic insertion point, and you get, you know, sort of a retention of the graft. And we can discuss this in the Q&A to see, you know, what people think about this. Now, there, there are other techniques which are, mimic this, but, you know, in Boston Children's, they're looking at this bridge-enhanced repair where fiber clots being utilized for repair as well. And some of the preliminary data has been very positive. Uh, what, do you, what about the outcomes in this repair group? This is a small series uh, by DeFelice showing 11 consecutive patients, 10, year, 10 were seen at six-year follow-up, all patients full range of motion, nine had a negative lock and a negative pivot shift with a mean life show score of 96. So potentially this may be the, the correct thing in, um, uh, in patients with femoral uh, avulsions in this pediatric population. Now, they also looked historically, this group, at patients treated with open repair, and what they did was tease out the ones with femoral avulsions, and what they were able to uh, show is that even historically, tear location played a major role, and the ones that had the repair, the ones that were detached from the femoral, from the femoral origin, those were the ones that with open repair had better success rate compared to the mid-substance uh, avulsions. Now, when you look at the outcomes of all epiphyseal anterior reconstruction, um, of the two 23 athletes, the one big thing from this study was that, okay, if you do it this way and spare both the physis and the tibia with the technique, I, uh, uh, the physis are both on the tibia and the femur with that technique, that the chances of growth disturbance are very low. Uh, here's another one looking at MRIs showing that, yeah, even though you come close to the physis, if you're on x-ray away from it, the MRI reveals minimal growth involvement uh, at two-year follow-up as the, gra the graft is incorporated. Uh, 
Uh, here's another one looking at all epiphyseal ACL reconstruction resulted in similar long-term functional outcomes compared to other standard ACL reconstructions, including bone patella tendon bone autograph reconstruction in an older population. So what about return to sports? And I think this is, this is critical, and this is uh, what can come out in, in, in our discussion in Q&A. Pediatric athletes typically return to sports after, at a high rate after their ACL reconstructions. However, the chance of a second ACL injury, whether it's in the contralateral knee or the ipsilateral knee, is extremely high. And with this population, if they return earlier to sports, the chance of a second ACL injury is extremely high. So in summary, non-operative treatment for complete ACL tears is poor. Increased instance of meniscus tears if you decide to treat these non-operatively. In the prepubescent patient, two to four years of growth remaining, and all epiphyseal technique is recommended. ACL repair techniques in select cases may be an option, but more research and long-term data is needed. Thank you. Leif, great talk. Um, question from the audience, Leif. Is there any role for allografts in children? Well, I, I think that's a, a great question. And there was, a, you know, a time where we thought that doing allograft and using bigger grafts may be better. But it's clear from the literature that allograft has a higher failure rate and that in this population it generally should not be used. You should be using some type of autograft, whether it's a hamstring graft or more po what's becoming more popular as with these physial sparing techniques, you, you want to have one solid graft that an all quadriceps tendon sort of reconstruction is becoming popular in this population. Would you consider it in, an, in a revision setting, in these young, young patients? Yeah. Uh, quadriceps tendon? A absolutely. No, allograft. Allograft. Oh, allograft. Okay. So, great question. Uh, I, I would certainly exhaust all my autograft options in this population. So, if the hamstring failed, I would consider a quadriceps tendon graft. Yeah, I totally, I would echo that completely. But, you know, the rate of retear, so not just for, uh, so for a graft, the rate of retear is three to four times higher in kids using an allograft versus an autograft. But not only that, you know, we used to, we used to harvest hamstrings. And I think, you know, one of the problems with hamstrings is that your quadrupled hamstring would be too, the, you know, the girth would be too small. You would be at a higher risk for retear. Sure, then you could you, you know, could you do five strands? You could, but then did you have enough of your graft in the tunnel? So we used to, um, you know, pretty freely augment those with allografts, right? And so have a hybrid construct of autograft, allograft, and those also have very high retear rates. So I think, I think there's something about the allograft tissue itself that, that kids just do not do as well with it. Yeah, and there, there's what, well, one of the questions asked uh, that latest research recommends nine months before full return to sports for high school athletes. Now, with adult techniques, bone patella tendon bone autograph with solid bony healing, I, I think this is reasonable. Though, if you really critically look at the data in the literature, the, the, these patients that pass these functional ACL screens uh, where – that's what I do before I let them go back in nine months, they have a higher instance of contralateral injuries. So for me, if I can get these patients out to a year, that's where I, I feel more comfortable. Now, what's the data on that? Well, you know, really the, the concept that Freddie Fu brings us up, we really should be looking at probably, you know, we get x-rays for, you know, bony healing. You know, we look at when we fix our clavicles, is it healed before we let them go back and play? And ultimately, we don't do that for ACLs. We do quadriceps strength, time. We're not really looking at follow-up MRIs. And this is probably cost-related, but the concept is, is that people heal differently. So in addition to the muscular tone uh, and restoring quadriceps, you know, function, that how, is the gra how does the graph typically look at that time. And it's going to be different for everyone probably. So Freddie's looking at this in a randomized way to determine, you know, what's the right time. And, and he's right that an MRI probably plays a role if there's some degree of vascularization or, um, you know, graft incorporation that's not complete, it, they, it may not be that, the right time for, for them to head back. 
Dr. Carter, we have one more question from the audience for you. <clears throat> and it's in regards to the increased incidence in female athletes, um, do you educate them regarding any hormonal changes or such? Uh, no, I don't. So I do not think that the data regarding hormones is robust. And also, so what if, so what, there's a little bit of data that says, hey, if you're in this part of your cycle, you're more likely to have an ACL tear. How in the world could you counsel somebody about that, right? I mean, I think, are you going to say, well, you know, you can't, you know, you're going to take a week off? I, I just think, I think the practicality of applying that, um, you, you know, in a sports setting is low. Uh, I also think, you know, my concern would be that, oh, hey, we'll, we'll fix the problem with a pill rather than hard work because what we, we actually have a ton of good data that tell us the training programs that work on proprioceptive function and neuromuscular training are effective. And so while I, I think it's interesting to pursue the hormonal aspect, I don't think the data is there to make clinical recommendations in the same way that there is for, you know, for biomechanical uh, training programs. All right. Thanks, Dr. Carter. So we're going to continue on with Dr. Carter, who's now going to talk about outcomes and hot research directions. Uh, it looks like as we're loading, uh, as we're loading that talk, there we go. Uh, there, there's also a question, when would a quad tendon autograph be the preferred choice? Uh, I think that's a great question, and cause, and I will. I think this is something you know that we can open to the panel at the end. I personally have gone to using quadriceps tendon autographs um, for most of my patients. It's all soft tissue, so you're not going to put a bone block across a growth plate. Uh, you, it's reliably robust in a way that hamstrings just aren't. It's a single piece of tissue rather than a quadrupled, you know, rather than a quadrupled graft. Um, and similar, and then lastly, and I think I'll touch on this here, you know, when we talk about risk factors for ACL injury and we talk about a high quadriceps to hamstring ratio, you know, why would we ever take the hamstring and worsen that and sort of, you know, and you're almost putting a patient after ACL reconstruction at risk for re-injury. So, and whereas if you choose a quadriceps tendon uh, instead, you know, that's not an issue. So I can tell you that I personally have started using them for most patients. Uh, anybody else you know, who wants to chime in, please do. Yeah, I agree, Cordelia. I, I think the concept of hamstring tendons, there's a lot of issues, right? It, it, it's critical in terms of, you know, having that posterior draw force on the uh, tibia. Uh, probably plays a role in, uh, you know, with a functioning hamstring for decreasing uh, ACL injuries. So I, I think the concept of looking at quadriceps tendon for a variety of factors including size of the graft, robustness, and, and certainly the amount of suturing that's involved in quadrupling the hamstrings and the unraveling potentially of this, you know, can play sort of a major role in terms of failure rates and things like that. So I think the quadriceps tendon is, a, is certainly becoming the, uh, the graft of choice in this population. Um, so, and the fixation is going to be button fixation uh, on either side. Similar, you know, to the tightrope, you're going to use a version of the tightrope or some version of that that's utilized with bone patella tendon bone uh, autograph procedures where there's fixation on each side, both a button on the tibia and a button on the femur. I use the sensory fixation on the femur and uh, interference screw on the tibia. Uh, and, but I would also just caution, you know, the only issue with quad tendon is, gosh, it seems like it might be the perfect graft, but we actually don't have the long-term data to support that yet. Um, and, and so, and I think, actually, I just reviewed a paper this week. You know, I, I think we're actively looking for that. But, uh, all right, I'm going to get started with this. So outcomes in hat research directions. No disclosures. Uh, uh, so this, you know, this is dovetails a little bit with what Dr. Jezrawi just reviewed, but so this is the algorithm of treatment that I use for my uh, skeletally immature, AC, you know, kids with an ACL injury. So if you look on the left there, you've got your prepubescent kids, you're going to tanner stage them, you're, you can look at their chronologic age as well. There's a kid with a lot of growth remaining, I'm going to do a fistule sparing technique, which could be either an IT band or an olipiphyseal technique. Um, I think some of that is actually where you trained, it's what you're comfortable with. The idea is that you recognize there's a lot of growth remaining, you recognize that they need to have the knee stabilized, 
um, but you're, and you're going to do something to protect the growth plates. In the middle here, it's the young adolescents who still have some growth remaining, but they're approaching skeletal maturity. They can probably get a trans seal ACL reconstruction using some of those seal respecting techniques that were just reviewed or maybe even a hybrid fixation. We know that um, we're more concerned in general about having um, an iatrogenic uh, valgus deformity with a closure uh, of the lateral uh, distal physis. Uh, after an ACL reconstruction than we are with the recurvatum deformity that we sometimes will see on the tibia. And then finally, the older adolescents who are basically skeletally mature, they're, you know, they're skeletally um, adults on the, on the, all the way on the right there, and they can have a true adult-type reconstruction with an anatomic, you know, with, so a, a low angle on your tunnel, trans seal across the growth plates tunneled, and you're going to use some kind of autograft, and whether that's a hamstring, a BCB, or a quad tendon is sort of dealer's choice. Uh, so, so just to look at the IT band, so who gets an IT band ACL? This is a kid who's got a complete symptomatic tear with a lot of growth remaining. There's nice things about this technique. There are no tunnels. We don't use any metal fixation, and it's autographed tissue, just like we said we prefer. It's soft tissue, so there's nothing crossing a growth plate. Uh, the olipiphyseal, which has just been reviewed, uh, is a same idea in terms of growth, or sparing the growth plates, different in that tunnels are drilled. They're drilled olipiphyseally. Still, you're going to use an autograph. Still, you're going to use a soft tissue. Um, and then the fixation for this can be variable. In terms of looking at the biomechanics of these uh, surgeries, so they actually re will reliably improve the stability of the knee over the ACL deficient state. This is a cadaveric study that was done looking at IT bands, all of pivot seals, and then a hybrid, uh, a hybrid uh, partial trans uh, ACL reconstruction in the lab. Um, what they found was that the IT band was actually the best at restoring both translational and rotational control. And then the flip side of that was that it had the potential to maybe over constrain the knee in flexion and internal rotation. When they actually looked at outcomes, you know, in kids, so uh, this was something that was, has been done at uh, Boston Children's for a very long time, and so that's the institution who probably has the most experience with it. They published on that experience in 2005, 44 patients with an average age of 10 years and five-year follow-up. They reported good clinical outcomes, including, um, you know, objective measures of instability on exam, good functional outcomes as reported by patients. Only two of these patients required a surgical revision. They had a ton of growth, and despite this, they didn't note any clinically important growth disturbance. Cliff Willimon uh, in Atlanta looked at the same idea, 21 males, average age 12 years, followed for three years. Um, uh, they noted a 14% revision rate, but otherwise excellent outcome scores. And again, no growth disturbance, and that's the thing we worry about the most. Now we're going to shift to that middle section. So the older adolescents, some growth remaining, but not truly skeletal, you know, all the way skeletally immature. These are the kids that may get a trans seal reconstruction or a hybrid. Some of the physical respecting techniques that you've heard about, so we're going to use a soft tissue graft, not a BTB in this population. As we've just talked about, we're always going to use an autograft in kids. We know it's three to four times greater retear rate in this population if you use an allograft. We're going to use metaphyseal fixation. This comes from that same Herodica study. We're going to minimize dissection near the perichondrial ring. We can verticalize our tunnels knowing that, the, that we, we have less volumetric injury to the physis using that technique. We're going to avoid over-tensioning our grafts because it, so it, the graft doesn't actually function like a staple. Um, and then, again, we can think about doing a partial technique in the kids that we're worried. They've still got a fair amount of distal femoral growth remaining. Kids who get this uh, do well. So uh, same thing, looking at Boston Children, looked at their experience with uh, this with 60, about 60 patients, 15 years old, followed for about three and a half years. Um, they did, just as we talked about, a trans tunnel using soft tissue autographs and metaphyseal fixation, very low revision rates and high clinical outcome scores. This picture is actually showing you, this is a picture inside the bone of the femoral tunnel, and that white circle, that is the physis, was the true trans uh, tunnel. A couple other authors have similarly looked at this. Um, I, I will note uh, that the data here is kind of dirty, and what that means is these surgeries were not all the same surgery. If you look at the one on the right, they used allografts there. We should probably just throw that away. Um, if we look on the left, you know, these guys actually, they had 27 patients who were skeletally immature and followed them for 10 years. If you look at this, 8 of 27, so almost a third of their patients had a, a, fun, you know, a problem with instability or re-rupture. And just, even if they didn't have a fight seal arrest, that's a very high you know, rate of re-injury.
Uh, and then lastly, if we go all the way to the right, the older adolescents with the closing growth plates, they're the ones who are going to get the adult type reconstruction. Um, I'll go over their outcomes in a minute. What I wanted to highlight here with graph choice, which we have already uh, sort of touched on. So in, in, this, in these kids, autographs always, we've said that. Uh, traditionally, this is hamstring versus BTB. Those are the ones we've got the most uh, experience with. Uh, a recent meta-analysis for any of you who just took your, um, who just re upped your boards have read this article probably, but so there's no difference in retail rates for people, for kids who have used hamstring or BTB. People who have a BTB autograft are more likely to have anterior knee pain. Those with a, an autographed hamstring will have uh, higher amounts of instrumented laxity in the knee. But really at this point, it's still dealer's choice. And again, I'll bring up this function or this idea of quadriceps tendon because some of the pitfalls that we have with our hamstring and BTB just aren't an issue with quadriceps. So, again, it's reliably sized. Uh, the biomechanical properties are excellent. It doesn't worsen the quad-hamstring ratio. I already talked about that. And you don't get that anterior knee pain. I saw a patient today, two years out from surgery with a BTB, um, you know, who was really complaining of that. And so, you know, it's a real thing. And if you're a patient who has that, you know, did your knee actually get made better? Uh, I'm going to touch on rehab and return to play, although Heather's going to talk about this a lot more. But what I will say is that, you know, we don't have any standardized guidelines for this. So it's not just, oh, six months or nine months and then, you know, dang, a timer goes off. You know, you're like your knee was a cake and you're ready to go back. So our understanding of how we evaluate kids after ACL reconstruction for their readiness to return to sport is still in evolution. Um, again, we used to just say, well, it was six months. Then we said, well, we look at motion. We measured the quad. Now we're looking at functional movement screens. I mean, there are some people who now are even disillusioned with these. Um, but what we do know is that even nine months after reconstruction, adolescents oftentimes will not demonstrate adequate functional movement patterns to allow a safe return to sport. So we haven't, we, we, we don't understand this yet. And even more so, um, we are really just getting started understanding how to address the mental and emotional component of return to sport. Um, and I'll, I will touch on that again in hot topics. So what are the common complications after reconstruction? The rupture, contralateral injury, arthrofibrosis, and growth disturbance. Uh, I bring up this slide. This is my too happy for everyone sad. Mark Paterno looked, um, you know, reported 2014 on nearly 80 patients who had a reconstruction, and they they had a controlled cohort. These guys were followed for two years after return to sport. And what they found was that those that had undergone surgery had a six times greater rate of ACL injury compared to the controls who did not have an ACL reconstruction. Oftentimes, this a secondary injury was actually the contralateral knee, and this was more common in uh, girls and boys. Um, uh, but still almost 10% it was the ipsilateral knee. So this is a high re reoperation rate in the first two years. And uh, just for its time, I'm going to keep going. But this has been recapitulated elsewhere. We know that arthrofibrosis or stiffness is an issue in kids. This is, again, is a series of out-of-Boston children's uh, keynotes or key takeaways from this slide is that actually in this population, there's an almost 10% rate of arthrofibrosis. Risk factors were being a female, older age, using a BTB autograph, and as well as if you had a concomitant meniscal repair. In terms of physical considerations, uh, and this was touched on in the last talk as well, so a traditional technique, we drill directly across the growth plates, and the growth plates can be injured by direct drilling, by thermal injury, by placing fixation devices too near the physis, or by putting a block of bone directly across the physis, or by overzealous dissection around the perichondrial ring. Uh, traditionally, we've thought that, you know, if you had less than 5% of physial uh, disruption, this would not go on to arrest, whereas 7 to 9% did result in an arrest. Something I think is interesting is there's a couple of studies that have looked actually at volumetric injury, and they've tried to uh, simulate doing an ACL reconstruction using MRIs of kids of various ages. And what they found, if you look at this J1 on the bottom left here, looking at the kids at 5 to 10 years old, even drilling tunnels up to 9 millimeters in uh, diameter, there was still about 5% or less of disruption of the growth plate. And the, one, the study on the right demonstrated if they drilled an 8 millimeter tunnel that there was less than 3 percent of disruption. They also noted uh, that verticalizing the tunnels uh, mitigated this. Despite this, 
uh, you know, growth arrest is still reported. Here are two series in which growth arrest is reported after a transficeal ACL reconstruction, clinically important growth disturbance, uh, recurvatum. So that's if, you, uh, if the tibial uh, tubercle apophysis is injured, genuvalgum if the distal femoral lateral uh, physis is injured. So, you know, despite our best efforts, this still does happen, and this is something that we would like to be, you know, a non-event or a never-event. In terms of, I'll just do two quick hot topics. One is the sex-based differences in ACL outcomes. So we know the females are more likely to get an ACL injury. We know they've got more hormonal risk factors. They've got more biomechanical risk factors. But also, you know, when they get the surgery, their outcomes aren't as good. Their clinical outcome scores are lower. Their return to sport rates are lower. Their revision rates are higher. And their instrumented, instrumented knee laxity is higher. So uh, girls don't do as well. And this is the one I think is really interesting. This, these slides are courtesy of Dr. Uh, Melissa Cristino, whom I've also been working uh, with on ACL stuff recently. Uh, and so what we know about return to sport is that ACL rehab is challenging and it requires a, both physical but also a mental commitment. Many kids don't go back. So in fact, sometimes less, you know, just over half go back. Kids who are more likely to go back to sport after surgery are males people who are younger, a higher pre-injury uh, level of activity, and if they didn't have other injuries. And there's a lot, and I've listed them here, a lot of psychological barriers to going back to sport. This is the slide I think is most interesting. So these guys look to see if fear related to functional performance measures and secondary injury after kids went back to sport following an initial ACL reconstruction. They looked at 40 kids who were cleared to go back to sport and they followed them for a year. They looked at the scale of kinesiophobia, so, so fear, hop test and quad strength. And what they found was that people, the kids who had higher levels of fear did less activity, had greater asymmetry on the functional test, but I know perhaps most alarmingly, we're 13 times more likely to have a second ACL tear within the first two years. So there's something real here. We're not, we're not doing enough. Uh, and psychological readiness to return to sport is a thing. So these guys looked at uh, athletes that were cleared, and what they found was that only 25% uh, went back to sport at the pre-injury level. Males more likely to do so. The ones that went back were psychologically ready to return at a higher rate than the ones that weren't. And again, males, younger, shorter interval, this, all this kind of stuff is the things that predicted a successful return to sport. So that's a field, a real, I think an emerging field that will be really interesting uh, to see, you know, how we can impact kids in terms of getting them safely and effectively back to sport after an ACL injury. So take home points, you know, again, our primary concern with ACL reconstruction in kids is damaging the growth plate. We know that physial sparing and physial respecting techniques will both reliably afford biomechanical improvement as well as functional improvement, but that really our current management of ACL injuries in kids is imperfect. There are very high rates of re-injury and reoperation. We still see growth arrest, and a lot of these kids don't go back to sport, even though that's the stated goal at the time of indication. And so we really need, I think we need to continue to study these kids, uh, and that's what we will do. How does this help us treat, our, treat them? Well, I would recommend prevention for all players. Maybe we think about doing mental health assessments as part of a prehab. We can think about how to change our surgical technique, and whether we evaluate the, you know, how we evaluate the physis. Again, I'll highlight the quadriceps tendon. And how can we change our postoperative rehab so that kids are not just physically but also psychologically ready and we can reliably return them to sport safely? And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Heather. Thanks. Thanks so much, Cordelia. Now, Ms. Heather Milton. We'll talk about ACL prevention and return to sports assessments. Thank you, and thank you all for hanging around to the bitter end. Um, I have the pleasure of working with these wonderful surgeons and seeing their patients once they have been out of surgery for between six and nine months, ideally, so we can really take a look at a, a, a variety of different testing procedures that help us identify rather than just looking at time since um, injury, we can really look, take a look at their functional capacity, their strength, and how they look as compared to their uninjured peers, which will help to guide what they need to do to return to sport um, safely and try to prevent those recurring injuries that we have seen today. So the main objectives are to talk about just a couple screening tools and then some of the prevention strategies. So. The main take home from this slide is that though I'll present just the physical screen today, there is much more to consider as Dr. Carter has already introduced. Um, we must consider the quality and quantity of the load placed on the ligament 
And I'll review the skills training that we may enable our youth athletes to tolerate load more safely. So the three main mechanisms for injury are the landing from jump, one stop deceleration, and pivoting and cutting. And this is why those movements are important. The knee is really designed for sagittal plane movement, as I'm, I'm sure we can all agree on, mainly flexion and extension. So any movement in the frontal plane is really contributed from the hip and the hip adduction as well as internal rotation. So we can identify the weakness in the hips as excessive hip adduction and internal rotation can lead to knee valgus, stress, and subsequent injury. So real quickly, we'll just review. If you take a look at the skeletal images here, we can see that the image on the far left is a healthy landing on one foot. So there's a slight varus moment as the pelvis remains stable. If we look at the middle, we can see if there's a weak hip, then that opposite hip is going to drop, causing a greater varus moment. But what we tend to see much more often is this compensation pattern of the knee moving in and the hip moving out so that there's much more valgus stress, as you can see in the image to the right here. So one way we can really um, take a look at if this is happening is through landing mechanics. So jump landings are a great way to, to look at the patterns. Whenever I have somebody's jump la I landing, I go through a series of, of checklists like I have on this slide here. The picture on my previous slide was a per perfect example of the knees collapsing inwards towards each other, hip adduction, and pronation of the feet. We also want to take a look at knee flexion, as was mentioned earlier. It is a key factor for injury prevention as well. Landing on the heels with a high knee extensor moment is highly correlated to injury, and this is something we really want to educate our athletes on as they return to sport, that it's okay to load the quads and the glute muscles so that they can help to support the knee joint. And we, of course, are going to look at symmetry because that is going to impact the loading patterns as well. And the overall, if there's a stiff landing or a well-controlled movement and deceleration. Now, taking a look at cutting, this is from a retrospective study that looked at more than 2,000 youth athletes ages 5 to 17. ACL injury rates were 4% higher in athletes 13 to 17 than in 5 to 12-year-old age groups. And females did have a higher incidence in both age groups. When compared to uninjured athletes, video analysis demonstrates that female athletes had an increased lateral trunk lean and a higher risk of ACL injuries. In the graph to the right, you can see the amount of lateral trunk movement and how much it increases in that higher risk group from age 12 to 14. Trunk motion can influence knee load through both mechanical and neuromuscular mechanisms. If the trunk moves laterally, the ground reaction force vector will move laterally and have a greater lever arm relative to the knee joint center, similar to that skeleton image I showed earlier. So this is what I'm looking at with my athletes. I want to see that um, when we do sport-specific movements, like my athlete here, when they do a lateral bound, I want to see that their foot is landing closely to their midline and the trunk is on the inside of that foot. Now, I, being an exercise physiologist, I have to mention the physical conditioning component as well. Taking into account the frequency of exercise and competition is important, as some children may seem more like energizer bunnies, but that doesn't mean that their neuromuscular system really is. Um, this is not completely on the onus of the therapist or the treating clinician, but we do need to make sure that youth coaches and parents are educated on this and the signs and symptoms of fatigue and provide appropriate rest as needed, especially when athletes are returning to sport. So one way we can counter injury-related fatigue is to keep our youth athletes that are healthy active year-round, but with appropriate volume of training. The key word there is appropriate volume, not too much or too, too little. Most time for younger athletes, we want to design exercise and starts to stop, making it more like playtime rather than a standardized program. Um, but we need to remember that though an, a youth athlete may feel like they can go forever, they may have less body awareness to identify when they are doing too much. And it's up to the adult, the coach, and the parent to let them know when they've done too much. Now, moving on to prevention, youth Athletes as young as nine can safely take part in training programs and begin integrative resistance training. This may not be in the form of heavy lifting, but more in the vein of body weight supported exercises and neuromuscular control of movement. 
training should be characterized by short bursts of physical activity and dispersed with brief periods of rest, especially in the younger age groups. Protocols that incorporate resistance training in preseason and in-season conditioning programs reduce ACL injury risk factors as well as ACL injuries themselves. However, there's only a small minority of youth athletes participating in integrative neuromuscular conditioning programs prior to sports participation, and that's something that we can change. Well, there's not one combination of exercises, sets, and reps that has proven to optimize training adaptations, it may come as no surprise that multifaceted integrative programs that increase muscle strength, enhance movement mechanics, and improve functional abilities appear to be the most effective strategy. So understanding youth development, of course, is important, and we, we heard, did hear about this earlier. We want to consider peak height velocity in, during the training as well as during play. Strength coaches and coaches alike must identify that these periods of time are crucial in monitoring technique, fatigue, and power development as tissue integrity is changing as a center of mass, limb length, and coordination. So though not every kid can go through a one-on-one -on -one strength and conditioning program with a registered clinical physiologist, like Dr. Carter mentioned, there are programs out there that have been proven to be highly effective in terms of prevention. And yes, it is much more cost effective and effective in general for reducing injury risk if we across the board have our athletes in dynamic warm up and strength programs prior to practice and games that can help to prevent injuries like these programs, like the PEP program, as well as the FIFA 11, which is very similar. They're both developed by, by a panel of physical therapists, athletic trainers, and physicians and really identify the neuromuscular and strength and plyometric work that is needed to best prepare our youth athletes. So we indicate there that the problem solved. If we have all of our players doing that, then we can prevent the injuries for our youth athletes. But the problem really lies in the fact that uh, there's not a lot of adherence to these programs. Uh, we can see when the adherence is very high in a research study, 88% reduction in ACL is great. But when there's partial adherence, it can be as low as 27%. So I actually found one review by a group in Oregon that assessed all the high school soccer teams in the state and found that less than 15% of all the teams in the state actually did the PEP or FIFA 11 or similar program. And of those, only 7% did the entirety of the 20-minute program. So we need to educate coaches and create some form of accountability here so we can help our athletes more. So in summary, I had it as several risk factors for ACL injury in youth. It's important to remember it's a whole body risk pattern and there's multiple factors that we need to consider, not just one movement pattern. And we have great programs to, that can prevent injury. We just need to do more work in terms of disseminating them. Thank you. Great job, Heather. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think we may have time for one quick case. I know time is running short, but Cord uh, Dr. Carter, would you like to talk about one quick case? Oops, sorry, I was on. Oops. Yes, yes, yes. I'm always on mute. Sorry. Yep. All right. Yeah, well, can, you, can you guys uh, can you guys pull up case number the first case? It's a uh, yep, Carter Bloom. It says. Yeah, that one. Great. All right. Well, this, I, this, this, I think this one case just has, um, ha, you know, is good for discussion points. So, and we'll just go through it quickly. All right. Uh, this is a 13-year-old male. He was on a motor scooter. And when I say versus a car, I mean he actually hit the car. Uh, otherwise, totally healthy kid, never had surgery before. He had a whole host of musculoskeletal injuries, an open left femur fracture, huge soft tissue wounds, open fracture dislocation of the ankle, uh, ipsilaterally, as well as the metatarsals, various avulsion fractures about the knee, and actually the limb was pulseless when he came in. He also came in um, with a skull fracture and some subdural hematomas, uh, hemorrhages and, uh, within, the, uh, within the brain. So right away, once the OR ankle got IND, reduced and stabilized and VAC, the femur got IND and stabilized and VAC as well. Um, and I can show you. So that's what we did provisionally, got IND and VAC and then antibiotic beads. And then, you know, we'd noticed at the time of uh, the surgery, 
and I've circled that I've circled here, you know, these little, um, these little flecks of bone within the knee. And that was concerning. Uh, and so, and so we ended up with an MRI and then for the soft tissue, uh, we got, we got a plastic consult as well. Here's his, uh, sagittal MRI. So this shows a bony avulsion that's displaced of his uh, posterior crucial ligament, um, as well as a mid substance injury of the anterior crucial ligament. We can go through that a little bit. Uh, he had a bony avulsion of the lateral collateral ligament. That's what this is circling here. And so uh, overall, what our, that MRI of the knee showed us was that, that mid-substance ACL tear, uh, an LCL and popliteus insertion avulsion fractures from the femur, an avulsion fracture of the PCL, and then he also has some, the, you know, the bony contusions that you would expect. In terms of the femur fracture, so ultimately he got uh, transitioned uh, into an intramedullary nail. He then, and then this was all staged, the post-op day 12, he underwent, um, or post-injury day 12, I guess. He had open repairs of the posterior cruciate ligament as well as the lateral collateral ligament, and this is a technique that was used. This is what that looks like. He subsequently underwent skin grafting because he did have those huge wounds. And then, you know, perhaps uh, predictably, he went on to get arthrofibrosis, and so he ended up having a manipulation under anesthesia. Here are the uh, images from that. Subacutely, he did okay. Uh, he went to inpatient rehab. He uh, did have some behavior problems. He really regressed. He had some little infections that, you know, always gave me heartburn. Uh, and then he was sort of lost to follow-up. So nine months later, he comes back and says, hey, Dr. Carter, I'm doing tricks on my bike and my knee's giving way. Uh, and so I, and to me, I, I think to myself, this sounds like a functional instability of his ACL tear that wasn't reconstructed. Uh, his behavior is better controlled, so it seems like maybe he's going to be better able to handle a surgery. Uh, and he's gone back to school. And on exam, he's got an effusion. He's got atrophy. Motion's reasonable. He does pivot. He's got an increased uh, posterior drawer sign, but it does have an endpoint and negative dial and varus and valgus testing. This is a repeat MRI. You can see that PCL looks pretty good. Those are the tunnels we drilled. Uh, he, of course, has that mid-substance ACL tear. We haven't addressed it yet. Uh, the lig or the bony avulsion of the LCL has healed, and you can see those tunnels as well. Uh, and so this is and so he's got a, he's got a, a symptomatic a functional instability of his ACL tear at this point. And so you know pre-op he gets a, a three joint standing film, so we make sure he doesn't have any malalignment that we need to address. His knee has reasonable motion. He's got a bone age of 14, so approaching skeletal maturity. He could probably get that transficeal ACL reconstruction using a soft tissue graft. Um, however, at this point uh, in my career, I, I would have done to me that would have been a hamstring. Uh, and he looks, if you look at his knee here, he's got a ton of scarring over the epsilateral hamstring harvest site. Uh, and so, you know, what I elected to do was an ACL reconstruction. I actually went to the other knee, the contralateral quadrupled hamstring autograft. Uh, I did that transficeal reconstruction, but I used ficeal respecting techniques, so soft tissue, suspensory fixation away from the physis, didn't get over tension. And then with his history of arthrofibrosis, I used the post-op CPM. And here are his intraop films, or his uh, pictures. This is skeletonizing the PCL. He had a fair amount of uh, scarring still. Uh, I used an accessory intramedial portal technique uh, so that I could get that, that tunnel a little bit more horizontal. This is that same picture, so you can see his growth plate. Actually, this was still a transficeal ACL reconstruction, passing the sutures, drilling the tibial tunnel. This is actually a picture, you know, through the inside the tibial tunnel. And then this is ultimately that graph. So this is looking at the anterolateral, uh, anterolaterally. This is looking anteromedially. Um, uh, and and uh, <laughs> he did great, of course. So I mean, to me, things to think about with this are actually we can see ACL injuries as kids and kids as part of a multi-ligamentous pattern. It's not been described, but we see it, and so I think it's something to look out for and something that we need to study. Uh, we do see arthrofibrosis in kids. You heard we see it 8.3 percent of the time. Um, what do you do with, with a graft choice in a kid when you know you want to use autografts and your ipsilateral hamstring isn't a choice? Now, you know, I would probably use an autograft quadriceps tendon, but in this case, you know, going to the other knee made sense. Um, you know, does every kid benefit from an ACL reconstruction? And I don't know the answer to that. I think if, not, if you've got a kid who's not able to comply or doesn't have the wherewithal to get the post-operative rehab and they end up with a stiff knee, did you make them better? Um, and, so, and so, again, this is, and that goes to gauging patient maturity and their ability to cope with surgery and rehab. Uh, and actually, if anybody from the panel has comments on that, I would um, be interested to hear them. Oops, or not. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, in terms of the, uh, what, what was the main question, Cordelia? No, no, there's no question. I mean, I think would somebody say I would have done a BTB or I wouldn't have reconstructed that, or I think you could say I would have reconstructed that right from the start. Or, you know, what else can you put in place just to, uh, you know, to, or, or, you know, you could say I would have used allograft yeah, I, I think I think the way you approach this case was, you know, very good. I, I think the these, once you start to get into multiple ligaments, trauma, it, it, it becomes, there's a lot of controversy in the literature how to approach these. And I think what you did by staging a lot of the things you do in, in kids, I agree with you. We, we tend to, if there's bony avulsions in kids, especially the PCL, we can fix them and they have better success rate in healing. So uh, I think that, you know, from that standpoint, uh, I like what you did on this. I, I like the... Um, you know, the fact that you use hamstring autograft, again, it's an autograft thing. But in a case like this, it's a multi-lig, multiple ligaments. Maybe, you know, there are people who, who prefer uh, allograft, and I think it's not unreasonable in this case as the failure rate because when multiple ligaments involved, seems to be less. But I, I would have done, you know, potentially a BTB. He may have done worse because he, he developed arthrofibrosis even with, you know, uh, hamstring autograft tendon. And um, you asked the question here, does every kid benefit from an ACL reconstruction? You know, I, 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 you know, over the years I've begun to, there are patients who you examine that are not clinically, from the standpoint of uh, an objective exam, have a tremendously increased Lachman or you don't pivot them. You know, I wonder if they would just be fine and, and traditionally um, fall into that coping class and are doing okay. So. Uh, I think that's a that's a tough question, but it, it's one that historically in the literature there there were patients who were fine, but now we tend to operate on everyone for fear of their meniscus pathology. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Uh, Heather, this one is directed towards uh, you. Uh, someone from the audience is asking, where can they find that 20-minute program you discussed? Where could they, where could they find that, uh, either online uh, or any literature you can provide them? Yeah, so I actually just sent out the link. Hopefully everybody can see that in the, the Q&A. Um, so FIFA actually does provide their program to the public, so they really do want people to start using it, especially coaches, as much as possible. So so it's out there. If you just Google FIFA 11 plus um, or the PEP program, you can find the, the list of exercises. Yeah, I don't see the link there. Oh, there, there it is. Okay. Perfect. Well, it looks like we have concluded the uh, presentation here. So I'd like to thank all of our presenters. And on behalf of NYU School of Medicine, I would like to thank you all for your participation in today's event. Please feel free to download the course presentations in your handout section. Uh, you will be redirected to the CME login page. Uh, please log in and take a moment to complete the appropriate course evaluation and attest to your credits to obtain your certificate. This concludes today's program. Thank you all and have a great day.